early start tonight, so you know what that means? It means we get out early. Because <laughs> I'm not long winded by no stretch of imagination. <laughs> and as and as as normal for me, I, I got a couple hours notice. Uh, Justin Justin Enos was supposed to speak tonight and he called me this afternoon and he is he sounded sick on the phone. He wasn't feeling good at all. So, so he didn't think he was going to be able to make it, so uh, we're going to get another Sunday school lesson tonight. But, uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 41 in a few minutes. Uh, as far as uh, announcements are concerned, uh, I think uh, monthly matters coming up on the 3rd of, of March. We've got a... Uh, is March the 5th, there's going to be a wedding shower for Brittany and Cade, and then their wedding is going to be March the 19th at 5 p.m. And a wild game supper is coming up. I hope everybody is involved with that. I hope everybody's praying for that, praying for our speaker, praying for souls to be saved. That's what we're doing it for. We're not here to, we're here to have a good time. We're here to show people that Christian, Christians can have fun, enjoy themselves, and have a good time, but more than anything else, we want people to be saved through this event. <clears throat> uh, I don't know of any other announcements that I might have missed. But I, I don't know of any, but I think that's pretty much all. Brother Ray is there out of town. He should be back Saturday. So just remember them as we, we're traveling mercies. Uh, Ms. Suge just texted that one of her clerks is, uh, did, some, did y'all get that text? Uh, her clerk is having some artery problems or something, so did, she didn't give a name, I don't think, so let's remember that. If you're not getting text messages over the phone from the church, I think the number is on the back. Yeah, Larry Wainwright's number is on the back of bullet. Be sure you call him and get hooked up with that because they send out text daily. 10, 10, 15 times sometimes a day in messages and and uh, it's just a good, it's a good opportunity to to stop in the middle of the day and and take time and, and be sure you're taking time to pray for when you get a text over the phone be sure you're taking time to take a minute stop what you're doing and, and pray for whatever the situation is because people wouldn't be asking for it if they didn't need it so let's remember that uh <clears throat> As far as prayer requests, uh, I have not heard any latest news on Mr. Leon. Thrift, has anybody heard anything new? Uh, I hadn't, so just keep him and his family in prayer. Uh, Maybe, maybe that's good news that, yeah. that he's doing some some better. <clears throat> so uh, let's keep remembering him. Anyone else we need to remember tonight? Amy, uh, Bruce, her mom's in the hospital. Uh, went early this morning. I think it's her gallbladder, but they're not sure. And she has heart and kidney issues anyway. Okay. Anyone else you might need to remember? My um, daddy's got um, rotator cuff surgery tomorrow. Curtis Taylor. So Curtis Taylor? Yes, sir. How's your little hard head doing? He's good. I seen him here tonight. He's, he's got a cap on. Everybody can see his little bandage, so he's got yeah, a so. <laughs> mm. Anyone else? <clears throat> Anybody else? <clears throat> uh, I have a supervisor. I've mentioned him several times before. His name is Casey Kinchin. He's actually our 
uh, our, the manager of our automotive claim department at Farm Bureau. He's uh, uh, he's been through uh, bone marrow transplants and several things and chemo, and they pretty much told me just a few months, two to six months, and I wasn't gonna try anything else. Just told him to just be as comfortable as he could be. He's he's still working. Really, oddly enough, he's he's, he's a hard worker. And uh, he'll, he'll work up to the last minute till he can. I know him. He's, that's just the way he is. <clears throat> his name's Casey Kenton. Just pray for him and his family as they deal with this thing. We don't ever know. God may intervene. And uh, he, he got a report last week said that his doctor said, your lymph nodes are clear for whatever reason. Uh, but when it comes back, he'll be back with a vengeance. So be ready. You know, I said, well, we don't know. God may intervene and cure him on, on this side. So. Remember that. Him. Anyone else? <clears throat> uh, Y'all remember my brother in law, Evan Mix. He has multiple melanoma. And um, he's been having quite a few issues, having some seizures. <clears throat> he has an appointment at Mayo on Friday morning. So if y'all can remember him in your prayers, and I think it will turn out better than we're expecting. Maybe so. Uh -oh. Ronnie got a favor for the young girl that was uh, missing. They didn't find her uh, safe. Everything's good. She had a boyfriend's house. And uh, you know what I'm talking about now. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. <coughs> uh, certainly. Certainly will. <clears throat> Anything else? Pray for our son for traveling mercy. He's in Atlanta. Up there for a couple of days with work. A place where I wouldn't want to be anyway. <laughs> I hadn't lost nothing in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> <coughs> Anything else? The wild, game wild game supper's coming up. Just remember the speaker. Oh, was it? I think his last name is Alexander. Is it Brian Alexander or something like that? Just remember him, and uh, as he's coming to uh, uh, bring God's word, and hopefully people will be saved through that effort. All right, anything else? <clears throat> uh, Brother Mike, Cruz, would you lead some more prayers with me? Think back a couple of years, if you can, the first time you heard the word COVID-19. What did you think about it? Uh, maybe it weren't going to be nothing to it. Uh, how many here had it? Just about everybody. Well, we know somebody that's been touched by it. And it's been you know, turned into what they call a pandemic. Uh, it certainly hits home with you if you've had it in it. Uh, we had it for about a month. We were, me and Tiny both were out of work. And it hit us pretty hard. My sister, Vicky's just getting over it. You know, some people has it for, my son had it for less than a week and they were good, so we don't know. But uh, a lot of things in life 
that we would call hard times, we can't avoid. Just like this, this, this COVID, it was probably unavoidable. And they say now, then, if you hadn't had it by now, you probably will get it eventually, because now then they got another new strain that's coming around. And they don't know what it's going to be or what it's going to take to treat it. But <clears throat> a lot of we've been studying in our Sunday school class about how to avoid life's pitfalls, the things that just come into your life, some by our own doing. Sometimes when you, you come across hard times in your life, you brought it on yourself. You know, whether it's uh, a, a failed marriage or it's job related, or you lose your job or you get laid off from your job. You know, you can't, some things you can avoid, sometimes you just can't. They just, they just happen. Uh, I don't imagine there's anyone in here old enough to remember the Great Depression back in the 20s and 30s. I don't think any of us were that old. I've had uh, grandparents that probably lived through it at my age. I'm 67, so I had some grandparents that lived through it. Think about the thing, and I can remember hearing stories about what people went through. Uh, they were, uh, I can remember Tiny's granny was saying that they would save aluminum foil and reuse it. You know, and we, we don't think nothing about it. I mean, they would take it and wash it off and fold it up and use it again. Yeah. <laughs> You usually forget better reception on your TV and town. <laughs> but, uh, and, and stuff that, you know, newspapers. They didn't throw away newspapers. Was, times were hard, you know. Uh, that was the, the, the financial situation, the financial markets when they collapsed. Most common folks like us, I mean, we didn't have anything to do with that, but yet we suffered those hard times. Uh, this story in Genesis 41 is about Joseph. And I, I was in this story the last time I spoke on Wednesday night. We were, we're, we're coming in our Sunday school lesson. This Sunday is the last lesson on it. Uh, but Joseph found himself in a situation where he was enduring hard times, not of his own doing. Uh, y'all, y'all know the story. He was uh, 17 years old uh, when his brothers uh, they didn't like him because through studying this, Joseph, uh, God was with Joseph even at a young age when he was he was 17. Like I said, when he was sold into slavery, but God was using him. Because you got those times were different because the Holy Spirit didn't live in man full time like it does now as a Christian. It would come and go. And, but God used Joseph in that he not only gave him dreams, but he allowed him to interpret those dreams. And he had a, a series of dreams and he interpreted them or told them to his brothers and his daddy what the dreams were. Y'all, y'all remember that they would wind up serving him one day. They would be his servants. They didn't none of them like that. They hated him because of it. Uh, uh, they, in one instance, they saw him coming across the field and to check on him. His daddy would send him out there as a young man to go check, see where your brother's at or what they're doing. But he was coming across the field, and they said, here comes that dream maker, dream teller. Uh, so they wouldn't even call him by his name. So they, uh, as the story goes, they uh, saw him coming. They took hold of him. They took his coat off of him and threw him in a pit, a dry pit, a cistern that didn't have any water in it, and was going to leave him there to die, or they were going to kill him. And uh, their older brother Reuben stepped in and said, no, he is our brother. He's, he's worth more than that. Let's just sell him. <laughs> I guess that's the better, uh, uh, better of the two choices. So they sold him to a caravan that was coming by, going towards Egypt. And uh, 
I think the Israelites or whoever it was, and they got to Egypt and they, they sold him to Potiphar. He starts serving Potiphar. And Potiphar saw something in Joseph. He could tell that God was with him, and he put him over his house. And, and again, we know the story is uh, his, uh, his wife accused him of, of trying to rape her, and, and he, he ran and, and left his coat there with her, and he wound up in prison. Uh, I suppose, having gone through this in our Sunday school lesson sat several weeks now, Joseph had as much right as anyone to be bitter and to say, well, times are just rough. I'm just giving up. Uh, you know, when we do that, we come to places in our life where we're, uh, maybe it's a, a bad marriage or a bad job and you have to quit or you leave. Or, and, you know, uh, I, I've been through situations where I've, I've left a job and didn't have another job to go to at the time. But, uh, uh, you know, it's sometimes, I guess my point is here, it's sometimes hard to see God working in that at that time. Why would a good and loving God cause me to have to leave my job? It's because he wants something else for you. You have to see, you have to, especially as Christians, we have to be able to see what the world can't see. We have to be able to see the good that God's going to do for us down the road. It may take two years. I, I can remember when we uh, was going to another church before we came here and got disgruntled for whatever reason, and we quit going and started going to another church, and we wound up here in just a, three or four weeks. I didn't see God working in that. I was just mad. <laughs> I was mad at the pastor over there. I was, you know, I was just aggravated. Uh, but I can look back now, 20 years later, and say, yeah, God was just kicking me out of the door. I got something else for you to do. And as long as you, he keeps you comfortable, Brother Jeffrey, in your recliner, you're not going to move. But if he gives you a kidney stone, you're going to get up out of that recliner and move, believe me. <laughs> He's going to give you something else to do. He's going to make you move. And it's strange how God does that. But in this, getting back to the story here, uh, Joseph's in prison, and the, you remember the baker and the butler wound up in there with him, and Joseph was taking care of them because they trusted him. The, the prison guard, again, it says, I, he saw something in Joseph. His demeanor was such that people could see God in his life. Even though he was, has been sold into slavery and now he's wound up in prison, he hadn't let it get the best of him. Now, I'm sure he had his days like most of us do, but to get to the point like that and people can still see God in your life, there's something to be said for that. And that's where Joseph was at. He didn't let it get to him. He didn't let him get in his head. So uh, the baker and the butler had their dreams, and, and Joseph interpreted them, and, and they came true. The baker was killed, and the butler was restored to his job. And uh, Joseph asked a favor of the butler. He said, when you get back to Pharaoh, he was Pharaoh's butler, he said, remember me. Tell him I helped you out so I can get out of here and see my family again. Well, he didn't. For two years, he waited in prison again. And then Pharaoh had the dreams that nobody could interpret. So uh, then the butler said, oh, I remember this guy. He's in prison. He interpreted my dream, and, and you gave him a job back. So they sent for him. And uh, he's come before Pharaoh now in, in, in chapter 41 in Genesis and about verse 28. So he's in front of Pharaoh now, and Pharaoh's told him his dreams, and nobody could interpret them. And what the dreams were was they were uh, one of the, he had two dreams in one night. Uh, they were seven puny cows, or sickly looking cows, devoured seven 
fat cows. I mean, and then he woke up and, and he went back to sleep. In the second dream, there were seven thin ears of corn that consumed seven plump ears of corn. Well, all his magicians and all, they couldn't interpret that. I, I, I couldn't. I mean, not, and Joseph couldn't either, except for one thing. It says in verse 28, it says, This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Joseph didn't take any of this on himself. He was letting Pharaoh know this is all this is of God right here. And I'm fixing to show you what God has planned for Egypt. <clears throat> it says, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Is what he's saying. There's going to be seven good years, and there's going to be seven really, really bad years. And the bad years are going to be so bad, you're going to forget about the good years. It's coming. And he says, for that, for, for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. What Joseph is telling Pharaoh here, this is God's plan, and God's going to make it work. Uh, most of the time, when we when we get to a point in our lives where we've fallen on hard times, whatever it is, whether it's an illness or whether it's financial, emotional, whatever the problem is, uh, whether we've brought it to ourselves or not, or whether someone else has caused us harm, most of the time we try to fix it ourselves. I know I do. I'm a mechanical kind of person, and I, I got nephews and nieces that think I can fix anything. My grandbaby, she thinks I can, Papa can fix anything. Mechanically, I've just never been afraid to tear anything apart. Now, I may not get it put back together, but I'm not afraid to take anything apart. Uh, With problems in our lives, why do we do that? Why do we try to fix it ourselves? Why don't we just give it to God to start with? God can fix it. He may already have, and we just don't know it. But we don't. I, do, I don't. I say we. I, I know I don't. I know how I am. I'll, I'll usually give up. Say, all right, Lord, I'm, I'm done. I'm tapping out. I'm I've tried all I can do. It's yours now. I've done made a mess of it. Uh, we don't allow God's plan to work in our lives. Joseph did. And because of that, he, he not only told Pharaoh, this is what's going to happen, and I can tell you how to fix it. Uh, he told Pharaoh, what you need to do is you need to get you a guy you can trust. And I'm paraphrasing here because it's, it's, that particular scripture is not in this lesson book that I'm looking at. He said, what you need to do is find you somebody you can trust. And in those seven good years, you need to pile up everything you can so that you'll have more than enough for the seven bad years. And I get the picture uh, my, my mind doesn't work what, what, like Brother Ray does. I can't, I can't, but I get the picture of Pharaoh looking around in the room and, well, who in the world's got that kind of sense? His, his own men couldn't interpret the dreams and he basically just looks at Joseph and said, well, you got the answers. You take care of it. I'll put you second in command 
right under me. Everybody in this country will answer to you. And now all of a sudden, he goes from being a prisoner in a prison to basically king of Egypt, second in command to the Pharaoh. Nobody. I mean, he's, Pharaoh's the only guy he had to answer to. They said that at one point that, uh, well, I'll, I'll start here in verse 47. <clears throat> It says, and in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food for seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up the same. Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering it, for it was without number. So the crops got so good during those seven years, he quit counting it. He was trying to keep up with it. We've got so many bushels in this bin over here. We've got so many over here, but it got to the point where he couldn't even count it. They just started stacking it up. Uh, they, they claimed that, and I don't know this, I hadn't done any kind of research about it, that they have actually found containers with dried corn in it in those some of those pyramids over there that was still good after all these years. I don't know how they were able to keep it that long or nothing like that. I don't know anything about that, but I know that Joseph did, and he'd done exactly what he was supposed to do. Uh, but what amazes me about Joseph is that through all of this, he never lost sight of what he knew that God was working in his life. I said it earlier. He had as much reason to be bitter and hateful, even towards his brothers, as anybody because of what they'd done to him. <clears throat> in... Um, Chapter 41, verse, or about verse 50, it says, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came, uh, which Anthla, the daughter of Potiphar, this is not Potiphar, this is another priest, Potiphar, priest of own bearing to him, so he, he got a wife, got married. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, he said, hath made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. In the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, if you're not careful, you'll overlook the fact that you remember Joseph is in Egypt. But he, and Joseph has a, Egyptian name. I didn't write it down, but uh, the Pharaoh gave him another name. He names his two sons Hebrew names. See, he never forgot his heritage. He never forgot where he come from. He never forgot his family. He named them after his Hebrew heritage. Why? Why didn't he just... Those people sold me into this, and here I am over here making a good living now. Why not just forget about all that? Because that's family. <laughs> no matter what they do to you, it's still family. And his brothers uh, uh, were probably as bad as, as any. <laughs> as far as brothers are concerned. <clears throat> and this, uh, verse 53, it says, And the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph has said, and the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So Egypt had plenty. And as the story goes on, if you remember, uh, 
two years after the uh, the famine had started, uh, Jacob, Joseph's daddy, sent ten of his sons to Egypt to buy something to eat. They were starving. They had they had money. They had cattle. They had the means, so he sent them to Egypt. And who did they see? The time they got to Egypt. Joseph, Joseph was the one handing out the corn. They didn't know it was him. He looked different. He's, uh, I think this is 20 years later, so he's like 37 now. He looked different. He talked different. When they, what, what I found odd, or he spoke with them through an interpreter. He wouldn't even speak to them in Hebrew. He was speaking to them in Egyptian that they didn't understand through an interpreter in the beginning. He accused them of being spies. He made them bow down before him. He done, I said, you know, if you don't know the end of the story, he said, yeah, Joseph's fixing to get these boys back for everything. And that's what they thought. When he finally identified himself to them, he always cried like a baby. Go read the story. We, we're, we're in it. We're covering that part in our Sunday school lesson this Sunday. Uh, he had completely forgiven his brothers. Completely forgive them for everything they'd done to him. He told them he did. He says at one point, <clears throat> what y'all meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. Robert, how can that be? I don't, when, I doubt he saw the good in it when he was in that pit or when they sold him to those Ishmaelites. He didn't see it then. But over the years, you, you, sometimes you just have to let God's plan work itself out. Don't give up, especially as us, as, if we, we call ourselves saved, we call ourselves Christians, uh, let God work his plan in your life. It may not turn out like you want it to. Uh, my life had, and I thought I'd be working for myself in my backyard forever and it didn't 15 years ago it come to a stop and I went to work for George Farm Bureau uh, but I can look at it now and say this is God's plan this is where you need to end up your working career you know and it's uh, I can see it coming to fruition now uh, <clears throat> uh, and that's when for me, when God's plan is more, the most challenging, challenging is when we can't see the end of it. I want to see, I want God to tell me what he wants me to do, and I want him to tell me how it's going to come out. <laughs> but that's not the way it works. Because if it did, we wouldn't be trusting God. We have to, you know, it's like we've been talking for Years now, even since Teak was here, about building a building a family life center, and it's going to cost a lot of money that we don't have. Uh, but if God is in it, we can't not do it, not be in His will. So. Uh, I think that's the thing that we as a church and as a people need to uh, try to figure out. What is God's plan for my life and for my family and for this church that I'm a part of? What is his plan and what is my part in it? Because we all have a part. If you're here and you're, you're members of this church and, you, and you're, you're saved, you have a part in it. God's put you here for a reason. He's put me here for a reason. I, I told it, I'd be the first to admit I don't even know what, what it all is yet. Uh, Parker, he's got you here for a reason. Harold, the same way. He's still, you're here for a reason. You'll, and you'll figure it out. God will show it to you guys. 
every one of us in here. He's got something for us to do. And we can't, we have to see it through. We can't give up. You can't give out. You can't stop what you're doing. We have to continue going down this road that God put us on. Uh, and when we do, we'll get the blessing from it. God, you know, that, that's one thing that's always amazed me that when I try to do something or fix something myself, most of the time I can, mechanically I can fix it, put it back together, make it work again. But uh, when it comes to the spiritual things in life, I just have to let God handle them because I'm not good at it. <laughs> I, I, I've told pastors before, and I, I've told people before, I'm probably not the most spiritual person in the room when it comes to uh, being at the right place at the right time and saying the right words to the right people when they need it. I, I find myself missing opportunities to uh, tell someone about Christ. Yeah, yeah even at my age, yeah, I, I miss them. I mess up. But you can't let that deter you. You just have to keep moving on and try not to do it again. Try not to miss those opportunities. Whatever it is, I, uh, <clears throat> I went in Lowe's today uh, and bought some, some stuff. We're trying to finish up our house. <clears throat> and uh, I had a cart full of, I bought some doors. I bought about five doors. And uh, the girl was checking me out. And they were stacked up on one of those carts, and I had some other stuff. And uh, she got to bringing it up and told me what the total was. I said, that's not right. I said, I think you missed those two doors under the bottom. I bought two, Johnny and John, I bought two slab doors without the jams because I'm going to make a barn door out of one. And... Uh, they were laying under the bottom of the mother door. You couldn't see them. I said, there's two doors under there. You didn't put on my ticket. You shortchanged yourself. And she looked at me like I was crazy. She said, uh, you could have got out of here without paying for that. I said, mm-mm. I said, I'd have paid for it sooner or later. I said, uh, my mom is in her 80s, and if she knew I'd have come out of here without paying for that, she'd beat me with a broom. You hear me? <laughs> She uh, she brought me up there, and that girl said, well, uh, you're just an honest person. I said, that has nothing to do with it. I said, w and then, you know, I'm like, okay, here's your opportunity, you know. It's, all, it's never wrong to do the right thing. I said, uh, if I've learned nothing else in my life as a Christian, you always do the right thing, you know, even if it costs you a little more. I, yeah, I could have saved a couple hundred bucks right there. I, I don't think I'd have got away with it. Yeah, it fell off the truck, or I had a flat tire, or something would have happened. Because you know, God, has, God has his way of letting you know you know better than that. You know, But that's what we have to do. That's what Joseph here amazes me about his story. He never gave up. He just kept... Even in prison, he kept impressing the guards. He kept impressing people with his knowledge of God and the fact that God was working in his life. And that's what we have to do. Even though we may be on hard times, but we just need to keep, keep moving it forward. <clears throat> well, that's all I have. I hope I haven't bored you too much with that. Anybody else have anything or any comments? All right, let's, uh, let's pray and be dismissed. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you tonight, Lord, I just pray most of all tonight, Lord, that I've said something that would stir someone's heart that would uh, cause them to look at you and uh, look at their life and, 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 and know what your plans are for them, Lord. Just draw us close to you, Lord, as only you can. Just lead us and guide us. Have your way in our lives, Lord. We pray that your will be done. We pray for those that's around us that are not here, that are sick and hurting. Maybe those that are even unconcerned, Lord, that's not in church. We just pray for those. Pray for our leadership. Lord, we pray for this country. 
we pray for what's going on over in Europe and in Ukraine and we like they're about to go to war, Lord, we just pray that you would intervene in some way and someone could uh, cause this not to happen. Uh, Lord, we just uh, want to give you the honor and the glory for everything we accomplish in your name. Amen.